We got four relationships, and if you wanted to, that we live in relationship with or that we live in the presence of. So if we wanted to stretch ourselves a bit, we could say we live before, and we want to stretch that, quorum, Deo, before God, or in the presence of God. In the Hebrew, Fani, in the presence or before God. And then, does anybody know one name that we might use for human persons? Homnibus, homnibus, human persons. So we live in the presence of other persons, and we'll call this horizontal relationship quorum, Oh, men, abus, the presence of human persons. And then we've already talked about this, that we live in relationship to the created world, quorum, mundo. And then the, the self sort of gets defined this way. Uh, if you want to just stretch selves, quorum, might so. Relationship to self. Now. One of the big questions that we have as human persons in our lives is um, how healthy are these relationships or what are, what are they like? And another question that we have in terms of relationships is the question of identity. Identity. Now, <clears throat> Luther lived as a young boy, very conscious of God. In fact, we could even do a little um, work here and kind of expand this. So God is really big, and so this is the, it's a triune God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why do you think I have blown it up a bit? What do you see in terms of the image of proportion here? Okay, it might be a primary relationship, but if we were to just look at this compared to this, and I could even make this bigger, God is big. I am small. Okay? So there's a distinction. I want to catch the distinction between the creator and the creation. A distinction... That's really important. So we have a distinction between the creator and the creation. That's really significant. Now, does anybody know what happened about the 1800s? Dig into your world history a little bit. Enlightenment. So enlightenment means that we sort of came of age, the lights went on, and something happened to our knowledge. But also something happened to this diagram. If I were to picture it, what do you think happened in the Enlightenment? Okay, good. So this gets reduced. So instead of going this way, it's now going this way. So... In fact, God gets pretty small, and in fact, atheism would say there's no God there at all. There's no God there at all. Now, so Luther lived with a big God, and he lived his life in the presence of this God, and his major problem was what God thought about him. What did God think about him? And so he struggled with that. What did God think about him? And there was one incident in his life. I'm going to keep track of the time here. There was one incident in his life when he was experiencing a lot of death. Now, does anybody know what the infant mortality rate was about this time? Percent. 
high, 40 to 60 percent of babies, children, little children died uh, at this time. And then you've heard of plagues that happened, wiped out whole cities. And so death was a very real uh, event in this particular time. And so life was faced with death all the time. And Luther was, uh, he grew up in a home where his father was a miner. He was a businessman. He gradually developed into his business so that he owned some mines. And Luther was uh, studying to be, he got his bachelor's degree, and then he was going to be a lawyer. His father was very happy about that because if he became a lawyer, that meant that his future would be very much cared for because he'd have a son who would have a very prestigious position, and, and that would give him I, uh, care and identity and all this sort of thing. Well, Luther had bigger problems than, what, than the future. He had big problems in the presence in that as he lived in the presence of God, who is righteous, he became increasingly aware that he was sinful. And so a sinful person living in the presence of a righteous God is a very capricious or dangerous place to be. So one day, as he had been back to his family, was coming back to a little city called Erfurt, uh, where he was going to go to the university and earn his degree in law. There was a lightning storm, and he was terrified. He fell down on his knees in a little place known today as Stotterheim, and there he prayed to the saint for the miners, whose name was Saint Anne. That was the patron saint for miners. Different, there were different saints for different vocations and different people. So he prayed to the saint, Dear Saint Anne, help me and I will become a monk. Because he thought the way, one of the ways that he could earn acceptance before this God was by going to a monastery. So here's a significant point. When Luther was at this stage in his life, it was the monks and the priests who had sacred vocations. Their callings, you mean their callings in life, they were sacred and holy. And the other people call, people's callings, whether it was a minor or whether it was a husband or whether it was a father or whether it was a printer or whether it was a teacher or whatever it was, those callings were not sacred. They were secular. And so Luther said, I need to get a part of a holy order, and this holy order is going to then make me right with God, and that's the way of salvation. Um, really making it kind of simple here, uh, but basic. Well, he discovered when he went to the monastery that it didn't help. He studied the Bible, did all the prayers. He was the most, uh, he was the most faithful of all monks, and it didn't help him in his situation at all. So, because he had been living in the Word, in fact, he learned to know the Bible so well that he told people that if you find, if you tell me a particular phrase in the Bible, I can find in the Bible where it's located. Now, he used the Latin Bible, so based on the Vulgate. So that's what he was using as in Latin. And uh, he didn't at this point have access to a Greek New Testament or access to a Hebrew uh, Old Testament. So he was working with the Vulgate. So he really knew the Bible. Well, God used the Bible. God used the Bible to help him discover that God is righteous and the righteousness of of God could be understood in two ways. Every time he heard that phrase, he shuddered. Because when he heard the word righteous, it meant someone was going to judge him 
to determine whether or not he was righteous. Have you ever been around? Maybe some of your teachers are like this. They're so holy, you feel sinful among them. You know, you have any teachers like that? You don't need to give me their names. But there are people that are so holy that just being with them, you just, oh man, I'm so sinful. Well, exponentially multiply that hundreds and thousands and millions of times, uh, you know, like 10 to the whatever power. And that's how Luther felt about the righteousness of God. Whenever he heard that word, it caused him to cringe because that meant judgment was coming and he was not ready to be judged. Well, then he learned that righteousness of God was not only a quality of God or a characteristic of God, but it was also a gift from God or of God. And it was the gift he discovered through the scriptures, Psalm 71, Romans chapter 1. He discovered that it was a gift, it was God's way of putting us right with him. And this freed his life so much so he used an illustration of a dog that breaks free from its chain and it runs through the yard sniffing for things all over the yard with a newfound freedom and it finds wonderful things all over the yard. And Luther said, that's the way it was when I received this gift from God's righteous, of God's righteousness. I ran through the Bible and I found it all over. That righteousness of God is also a gift from God that puts me right with him. Now, guess how that is significant for our topic today. It was this that gave him his identity. So when Luther broke through and saw that he was now gifted by God with righteousness, it gave him an identity. Now, we can try to get our identities from our parents. My dad is so-and-so. Now, if your dad's well accepted in the group that you're talking about and well known, that makes you what? Somebody. Luther was the son of a very good minor and a very influential person. But that was not a sufficient identity for him. And so then we could, we could maybe say, well, you know, my brother, he, play, he plays for the Green Bay Packers. You know, his name is Aaron Rodgers. You know, you know about him, right? You don't? Yeah. Where's Mr. Preston? He better, he better get up to speed on this. He's missing the boat. Okay. You know, he's a good Packer fan. There are a few of us around here, a few of us. We're targeted often, but... You know, we have survived. Who are the Packers? Okay. Anyhow, so, so we, can, we can try to find our identity with others, but we can try to find our identity with ourselves, or we even try to find our identity in being in oneness with the world, etc. The point here that I want to establish for us is that Luther found his identity in relationship to God. So then the triune God gifting him with righteousness became his reference point for how he saw life and how he lived life. And he learned about that through the word. And central in that word is Christ. So his identity was learned through the word of the gospel, centered in Jesus Christ, and so that gave him an identity. Now, the second thing I wanted to just, well, let me just pause there. I got to see how we're doing here. Um, I think we're doing okay. Got six minutes left. Not bad, huh? Seven minutes, maybe. Okay. Let me go quickly then, and then you can, we can interact. Out of this identity, identity, was something that we call callings. Callings. These callings then, they, identi 
The identical is vertical. We could put it over here. For Luther, his, his identity is vertically defined. That's who he is. The devil would harry him. The devil would accuse him. Others would attack him and accuse him. And he kept coming back to who he was in the righteousness of God as a gift in relationship to the triune God identity. The callings, they relate to how he lived this identity out in life. So we could uh, see if I can put that down more in the horizontal area. I'll put it down here. So how did he live out this new identity in Christ? Well, Luther had many different callings. One of the great things that happened in his life was marriage. At this time, priests did not marry. And there is still a group uh, within the church today, a uh, particular denomination, where the priests do not marry. So for Luther, marriage was one of the things that he entered into as a calling from God. And so marriage then was viewed, remember what I said earlier, what callings were sacred when Luther began? Only monks, priests and monks. But now Luther discovered, wait a minute, it is a sacred calling to be married. And so he took on a married life with a nun. Now, this marriage was kind of assigned to him. It wasn't sort of the, you know, the J.S. romance kind of thing that you, we have today. Oh, we think, we think that uh, Katerina would be a very good wife for you. Oh, no. And she said, I'd be honored to have Martin, the Dr. Martin Luther, as my, as my husband. So one of the, one of the uh, callings that he entered into then was marriage. And then following marriage, became, he became a father. And he saw being a father as a calling from God, as sacred and holy. Being a father, being a spouse, being a father. And uh, some other callings that Luther entered into is he became a teacher at a university. Uh, and he taught the Bible. And uh, so he was, he influenced life. Now, when you're talking, I was asked to touch a bit on how he impacted his culture. Well, when Luther was under attack, he went to a city of Worms, or Worms in West Germany, and there was a diet there. That was a meeting where Luther was on trial for what he had been teaching. And as a result of his trial, he was exiled, he was put under a ban and he was subject to be persecuted and could be killed. So some of his friends on his way back, now, if you were to think about Germany today, uh, Worms is over on this side of Germany, and Wittenberg is over on this side of Germany, and so he had to get back. Well, in between here and there, there was a little place called Eisenach, and there was an old castle there. It was filled with birds and all kinds of vermins and all kinds of things like that, called Wartburg. Wartburg. So some of Luther's friends kidnapped him, took him to that castle in Wartburg, and he was bored, and he was frustrated. So you know what he began to do? He began to translate the Bible, and in a number of weeks, he had completed the translation of the Latin Vulgate and along with the Greek into a New Testament translation of contemporary German. Luther's work as a translator is still being studied today in terms of his translation theory. And you know what happened? His translation established a new literary standard for the German language. And he saw that as a calling from God to translate the language of the Bible that only the ecclesiastical, the church leaders who had studied Latin, 
or Greek or Hebrew could, could read or understand so that everybody could understand it. And even though there were other translations before him, his translation marked as the standard for the German language. So he lived his life out as a, as a teacher, as a translator, as a father, as a spouse, um, many other ways that he lived out his life. Let's see if I uh, missed anything. Oh, he did something else. He engaged people by letters. Uh, I don't have the complete set of German, of Luther's works in German, but I have the complete set of the English work. And he has hundreds of letters that he wrote to people. People would write him a letter, and he would write back, and they're fascinating. Another thing he did was that they had a very open home, and they had table talks. And people would come, and the students and others and neighbors, and they'd listen to these table talks. And another thing that he did, he wrote hymns, many hymns, in the language of his people, in the German language. Well, so how did he, where was his identity located, and how did that identity then give get lived out in the various callings of his life. Now, let's pause and take some questions. We've got a couple of minutes. It's hard for me to see you, whether you're sleeping or not, but anyhow. No questions? Does it make sense? Anything unclear? So this becomes... Uh, a model, a picture for you. To whom and from whom do you look to and receive your identity from? What does it consist of? And how does that get lived out in your various callings? Luther saw all of life as a gift. And he saw all of these callings as a gift where God was working through him for the benefit of his neighbor. A gift, whereas God was working through him for the benefit of his neighbor. Well, Mr. Garvin, we have reached the terminus on Gwen. Seriously, no questions, huh? I don't know. No questions. So, so, Serious. So, oh, hey, one question. Oh, yeah, question. please. Yeah. Um, it was very against uh, what he should do. How do you think Luther knew he should get married? Oh. Oh. Yeah. How did, how did he co discover that he should get married? Well, um, when he studied the scripture, he began to see that marriage was a gift. Then the next question is, is marriage a gift for him? And Luther believed that marriage was a gift for all, and for those who chose not to, they were the exceptions. They were the exceptions. Now, as far as I know, Luther never took Katharina von Bora, he called her, my dear Katie, on a date. And this sounds strange. Would you marry somebody that you hadn't dated? Now, some of you are from other cultures where that might be the case. So it wasn't, oh, I'm so struck with the beauty of this virgin nun. No, wasn't that at all. It was a, I believe, that she would make a good wife, and there were many others saying she would. And she was a Proverbs 31 woman. She was a better business lady than Luther. He would give away everything. He was always giving away stuff, you know. And so what happened? Because he understood that marriage is God giving you to each other, God makes that marriage. God giving you to each other in that vow and in that commitment. and gift, But gift is the foundational thing, that she was being given as gift to him, and she saw him as being gift to her, 
and the two being gifted together becoming one, and their lives then as gift to the world and their callings. And you know what happened? They grew in love. They didn't start out starry-eyed and just sort of floating in the air. No, they started out with both feet on the ground wondering what we're getting into, but God has given us this gift, and they grew in that love. Yeah. Very different from our culture in many ways. Yes? After his exile? Okay. Oh, yeah, there's a big story about this. While he was there in Wartburg, he heard about some dude by the name of Karlstadt who used to teach at the University of Wittenberg. And Karlstadt was, he was trying to shake things up. And so in the Catholic Church at this time, you could only receive one element of the Lord's Supper, the bread. And Karlstadt said, the Bible says that you should eat this bread and drink this cup. So Carlson said, from this Sunday forward, we're going to do what the Bible says. And it caused all kinds of chaos. Because, remember, this was the body and blood of Christ. And if I drop a drop of blood, I'm going to be cursed before God because it's his holy blood. And so people were fearful and and so Luther heard about this, and he disguised himself. He grew a beard, and he disguised himself as Junker Jorg, and he went back to Wittenberg, and he preached eight sermons there, which are fantastic sermons. And he said, we will return to what, the, to, to what you were doing. We're going to study the Bible and let the Bible change our minds. Years ago, Mr. Jar was in my church history class, and he remembers an essay question. I'm sure he does. Compare Karlstadt, Luther, and John Calvin in the way that they sought to reform the church. The point of that was that Karlstadt sought to reform people by the law, mandating, even though he was using the Bible. Luther sought to let the gospel change people's heart, changing their attitude to what the Bible was calling them to do. And then it was a gospel-based reformation of life rather than a law or rule-based. So then he was there, and then gradually he came out of exile, returned to his teaching in, in Wittenberg, and continued on. Does anybody remember when Luther died? Fifteen... Nope. Nope. 57. Nope. 46. So you can see 1483, 14, uh, uh, 1546, they didn't live very long. Hey, thanks, guys. Have a great day.